Thank you. Uh, delighted to be here, and particularly um, both because of the Rumi Forum, um, which I think has really established itself in Washington, um, even if sometimes I'm not here as often as I should be. Um, and, uh, but even more particularly, um, to moderate this session, uh, dealing with a colleague of mine, uh, Shiafa, who's uh, our Malaysia professor uh, this year, holding our Malaysia chair uh, for the study of uh, Southeast Asia and Islam. Um, I wrote the forward to her book, um, so I know why her book is, is important, but let me just uh, make a couple of uh, prefatory comments. Number one, uh, the author is uh, singularly positioned um, to address um, the theme that she's uh, dealing with, but also singularly trained. She not only is trained uh, in Indonesia, um, in uh, Islam, in Islam in Southeast Asia, in Arabic and classical Islam, etc., but uh, holds what I think is a fairly uh, unique uh, distinction um, for just about anybody that I know from the Muslim world, and that is that she has earned uh, two doctorates uh, in the States um, simultaneously, um, uh, which is really pretty remarkable. I thought getting one was uh, enough and couldn't imagine taking exams more than that, but apparently she has a high threshold for pain. Uh, <laughs> but right? in any case, it's actually very remarkable because she's really trained both in, uh, in, in theology and from a kind of comparative perspective, uh, as well as in uh, spirituality, and all of these things come uh, together uh, in, in her book. Uh, why is her book important? Well, I think she'll be telling you uh, what her book's about and why it's important, but just from my own perspective, when we look at a situation today in which um, Islam and Christianity are the two largest religions in the world, uh, and they uh, interface globally as no other two religions uh, do, um, and yet we know that historically, uh, while there have been uh, uh, moments of uh, inter interaction and uh, positive trans uh, transformations taking place as a result of those uh, interactions, um, indeed there has also been a history often of tension and conflict. A tension because uh, Islam constituted a theological and political alternative to, uh, to Christendom and to Christianity, which were, in a sense, the, the established powers on the block. Uh, and so when Islam came along, it was a theological alternative from, from a, uh, a, a Christian uh, perspective. In those days, this was seen as a challenge, if not a threat, to Christianity's claim that it was the final revelation from God with a universal mission. And also with the spread of Islam and the creation of uh, empire, uh, then you also had <clears throat> what, what was uh, seen and experienced as a, uh, a challenge to, uh, uh, to, if you will, uh, Christian imperialism. If you fast forward and we look at today's world, in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, with the growing presence of uh, Muslims uh, in America and indeed in the West, so that uh, Islam has gone from being invisible to the second or third largest religion, both in Europe and in America, uh, we've seen a boom in uh, dialogue and indeed trialogue between uh, the great monotheistic uh, traditions. But that dialogue often uh, takes place, not always, but often at a theological level. And uh, I think quite rightly, <coughs> Shiaf has argued that while that is good and constructive, it has its limits. Um, among other things, uh, when you take a theological approach, you get wrapped up in areas of doctrine and law, which at the end of the day are really human constructions, even though they are made in light of sacred sources, the end game is a human construction. And so, for example, all great faiths will say that God is transcendent, and yet they will then go on using um, their uh, uh, human reason to then construct a whole set of dogmas uh, with regard to God and God's nature and the implications. Uh, and these, these are not just perspectives, they become dogmas or doctrines, uh, which can both guide, but they also can divide. And in a globalized world, we more and more, I think, need to see the ways in which we come and touch each other. And I think one of the key distinctions that's made in this book 
is between our notions of God, which at the end of the day is a human construct, and, our, and the Godhead that is behind these human constructions. Well, the way to the knowledge and experience of that Godhead is really the way of the mystics, uh, the great mystics of the past, whether it's Meister Eckhart, Ibn al-Arabi, uh, Rumi, um, uh, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, etc. And in this volume uh, uh, that she has constructed in making her argument, she takes two of the great mystics, Meister Eckhart and, uh, and Ibn al-Arabi, and has them in a sense have a conversation, but out of that conversation begins to talk about what are the possible uh, uh, results. What can we learn from this and how can this take us forward and perhaps provide a new paradigm uh, that, that, that is able better to engage a religiously pluralistic world and get us behind a good deal of the religious exclusivism of the past and more into a religious inclusivism. So, with those comments, I will turn it over to the author. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor John Esposito. And uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, Emery Abri for inviting me uh, to this forum. I think this uh, I'm honored to be here to share my perspective, uh, especially my book. And also thank you, uh, Professor John Esposito, for your um, busy time, but you can spare with us um, a little bit. Um, actually, as uh, Professor John already mentioned, uh, that actually my, my book is all about. So um, I don't need to, to like to, uh, what is it? Yeah, to say again uh, the importance of the book, but uh, maybe I just uh, would like to, to add why mysticism actually. Because um, uh, in the past, maybe mysticism and mystic have been uh, related to uh, two categories, either that of the spiritual elite who embody the deepest form of faith, but who have little in common with ordinary life and the vast majority of their co-religionaries, or Sometimes they call the eccentric spiritual fringe whose ideas and practices border to the heretical. But today, mysticism and mystique have to come uh, to, to be seen in new light. Both scholar and general public have to come to perceive in teaching and life <coughs> of certain mystic a profound relevancy to the effort of mainstream believers to integrate the challenges of pluralism into their own religious identities. For example, uh, David Tracy, he sees in the mystic tra tradition a means for analogically participating in pluralistic dialogue on religion. The same also Hans Kung, for example, in establishing a common understanding with Eastern religions, he has turned to Christian mysticism negative theology. And on the popular side, um, this interest is mirrored by, for example, the fact that English translation of the poetry of 13th century Persian Sufi writing uh, in central Anatolia, Jalaluddin Rumi, were just a few years ago the best-selling poetry in the U.S. I think uh, uh, this is why indeed uh, uh, mysticism is a rich source for the ongoing interpretation of a religious tradition. And this is why I use mysticism and beside what uh, Professor John uh, was saying, uh, actually I'm looking for the place where every religion can meet. And I think mysticism is the place where every religion can, can meet. Um, um, I would like to go direct, directly to the book and how, uh, what is it, the conversation between both two mistakes can uh, have a note or uh, what is it, the point that we can use or we can apply for interface dialogue, especially for Christian Muslim dialogue. Um, one of the larger problems facing participants in Christian Muslim dialogue is the interpretation of certain biblical and Quranic verses, which are generally interpreted in highly exclusivist way and often cited by the opponent of dialogue. The book here is to imagine the ways in which a metric for dialogue which is centered around the key point of conversation between mystic masters, that is between Master Eckhart and Ibn Arabi, can provide a, f a framework for this dialogue which is more fruitful and more grounded in orthodox or mainstream tradition than those currently available. But before coming to the example of these problematic verses, I would like to describe a little bit about uh, 
a typological rabbinic exegesis that I use to analyze both mystic, uh, Master Eckhart and Ibn Arabi. <coughs> In his essay entitled The Teacher and Hermeneutical Task, a reinterpretation of medieval exegesis, Fishbane makes reference to the fourfold typology of medieval scriptural interpretation common to both Jewish and Christian tradition. For Jewish exegete, this typology took the form of acronym Pardesh, where P as Peshat, its mean literal meaning, and R Remes, the allegorical meaning, and D Diras, the tropological and moral meaning, and S sought the mystical meaning. The tradition of rabbinic mystical exegesis, known as sort, turned on the principle that the word of secret scripture speak to the reader without ceasing. There is a continual expression of the tag, and this reveals itself in the ongoing reinterpretation. But for Fishben, sort is more than the eternity of interpretation from the human side. It also points to the divine mystery of speech and meaning. Then Fishben goes on to speak about the prophetic task of breaking the idol of simple sense and restoring the mystery of speech to its transcendent role in the creation of human reality. So he has said that one of the primary functions of the mystical exegete, individual like Ibn Arabi and Master Eckhart, is to continue this prophetic mission. It is in the service of thought, that is, mystical exegesis, that mystical exegete, like our masters, mediate a multitude of interpretation as they resist the dogmatization of meaning and the eclipse of divine light of speech. Now, taking our lead from Fishburn, we can understand that as mystical exegete, exegete our masters seek to transcend the idolatries of language and to condemn hermeneutical arrogance in all its form. So actually, that uh, what I use for um, uh, for my book. Now, using Michael Fishburn analysis above, the first conversation point between the two discourses, which might serve as note for possible new metric for Christian-Muslim dialogue, is the hermeneutic or the way how they interpret the verses. For example, in their approaches to canonical scripture, Ibn Arabi and Mr. Eckhart fulfill the role of mystical exegete as Fishburn interpreted for us. They believe unequivocally in the infinitely in uh, readable text, and they champion this infinite readability in the hope of combating the idolatries of language and hermeneutical arrogance. Even according to Ibn Arabi, each word of the Quran, not to mention its verses and chapters, has an unlimited meaning, all of it are intended by God. So correct recitation of the Quran allows reader to assess to new meaning at every reading. Uh, he then said, when meaning repeats itself for someone reciting the Quran, he has not recited it as it should be recited. And the word is, this is proof of his ignorance. In fact, Ibn Arabi regard the word of language as symbolic expression, subject to the interpretive effort, which he called tabir that is the act of crossing over. For him, the truth of the interpretive effort presents itself in the act of crossing over from one state to another, and under this interpretation, differences become the root of all things, since for the thing to be in a constant state of crossing is for it to be constantly differentiated, not only, between, not only from other things, but also from itself. Thus, with respect to scriptural hermeneutic, our masters appear to be convinced in the infinite potential for meaning inherent in the nature of divine revelation, especially in the form of secret scripture. Such an understanding of the nature of scripture can be invaluable in dialogue because it demands that a person of faith not only take a stand of conviction within the, within the teaching of his or her secret stack, but also that they realize that this conviction, however deep it may be, does not restrict in any way the potential meaning of these texts. And if dialogue is authentic and bring about authentic transformation, then the encounter with religious other should have some effect on our religious self-understanding and therefore on our own reading of our own texts. Now, what are the other conversation points between the two discourses which might serve a note for a possible new metric for Christian-Muslim dialogue? The one that you just mentioned is on naming God. 
Out of the depth of their monotheistic faith, both masters, Mr. Eckhart and Ibn Arabi, are very concerned that as human being, being blessed with a special relationship to the source of all being, we never lose sight of our own limitation vis-a-vis -vis God. This limitation take many forms, one of which is the inherent inadequacy of our various languages and mode of discourse, and the limited understanding regarding God, who is ultimately and essentially beyond understanding that they convey. All too often dialogue break down or cannot begin because of a certain hubris with, re with respect to our understanding of God. In the context of the encounter of the uh, in, in the context of the encounter with the other, how many Christians are Christian because they feel that Christianity contains the best and highest understanding of the divine, and how many Muslims are Muslim for the same reason? <coughs> I'm not suggesting that this insight of the two masters regarding the issue of naming God should be interpreted to encourage relativistic thinking as a solution for this hubris. Such a reading, of course, would entail a gross distortion of the epistemological framework and religious worldview. Instead, what I am suggesting is that our masters demand that we adopt postures of profound humility as we stand before, and I would add, as we articulate to others our most deeply and passionately held belief and doctrinal formulation. All the piety and patience one could possibly master will not change the fact that our languages about God admit serious inadequacy and that if we are to be truly faithful believers, we have to let God be God both within and, with and beyond our various doctrinal formulation regarding Him. The second one, or the second note is God created by, by ourselves or by the believers and also the uh, versus the Godhead that you mentioned also. For Ibn Arabi, when a person rationally considers God, he creates what he believes in himself through his consideration. Hence, he considers only a God, which he has created through his consideration. Thus, here Ibn Arabi alludes to two different dimensions of human experience of God. The first is the God created by the believers, or the God of belief, which changes according to the predisposition of the believer, the second is the Godhead, or the unknowable essence. But contrary to the common caricature about Ibn Arabi's teaching, there is nothing wrong with the God of belief, or God created, created by the believers, providing that the believers themselves are always conscious of the degree to which this experience of God is conditioned in significant ways by their own limited and particular consciousness. And like Ibn Arabi, Mr. Eckhart distinguished between God as understood by the believers, or the God we worship on the one hand, and God beyond images and concept on the other, or between God and the Godhead. In fact, like Ibn Arabi for Eckhart, the God who is the object of Christian worship and devotion is distinct from the indescribable Godhead. God and the Godhead, Eckhart maintained, are as different from each other as heaven and earth. Furthermore, like Ibn Arabi for Eckhart, the worship God, that is the God of the believer, is partly human construction, as you mentioned before. She or he exists only in relation to the worshiping community. Eckhart writes, When I stood in my first cause, then I had no God. But when I went out from my own and received my created being, then I had a God. For before there were any creatures, God was not God but he was what he was. But when creatures came to be and received their created being, then God was not God in himself, but he was God in the creatures. Thus Eckhart warned the believers not to have a God who is just a product of his thought, nor should he be satisfied with that, because if the thought vanish, God too would vanish. But one ought to have a God who is present, a God who is far above the notion of man and of all created things. So where naming God speaks directly to the issue of language and discourse and the inherent limitation, God created by the believers versus the Godhead is a broader warning from our masters that we must always be aware of our ways in which we all, as human beings with limited understanding and perception, inevitably create God in our own image. The point the master are trying to make, however, is how important it is if we are to avoid idolatry to strive 
tirelessly to see the human, the created, and thus derivative nature of our faith tradition. Now I will apply those discourse above mentioned to the dialogue, what I call the challenge of dialogue. Um, I will give an example here, the Quranic and Biblical exegesis. Uh, one, the first one is Quranic polemical verses. For example, the verse of 551, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya ayyuhallazina amanu la tatahidul yahuda wa nasoro awliya. Ba'duhum awliya ubat wa mayatawallahu minkum fa innahum minhum inna allaha la yahdil qawman zalimin. Or you who believe, take not the Jew and Christian for friend or guardian. They are friend or guardian one to another. He among you who take them for friend or guardian is one of them. Truly, God guided not wrongdoer, wrongdoing. And, and another verse, Wa qalatil yahudu uzair ibn Allah, wa qalatil nasoro al-masih ibn Allah, zalika qawluhum bi afwahihim, yudohi'una qawlal lazina kafaru min qabl. Qatalahumullah wa anna yuqfakun, wa anna yuqfakun. And the Jew says, Ezra is the son of God. And the Christian says, the Messiah is the son of God. That is their saying with their mouth. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve of God. God fight them how perverse are there. Quot Allahumullah. A common radically exclusivist interpretation of these verses is that Jews and Christians are corrupted people practicing corrupted tradition of worship and belief. As such, they can never be trusted to be friend, to be friend, or uh, to the believers. Moreover, these people are understood to be the enemies of the faithful, since God Himself or herself faith him. Allahumullah. Now, a, a biblical interpretation. The, the Bible also have almost the same thing. But biblical exclusive verses with pretend, with present Jesus as one and the only mediator between God and humanity. We can see in Timotheus uh, 2, uh, verses 5, that there is no other name under heaven by which person can be saved, that no one comes to the Father except through me, that is through Jesus, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, that whoever sees him sees the Father. Hence, Jesus is viewed as the only one who truly and fully reveals God. It is in part on this basis of verses such as this that Jesus is claimed to be the particular and unique savior of the world. What the tradition of exclusive interpretation of both these verses have in common is they tend to be uninformed from within as well as from without. By, in, by uninformed from within, I mean they are usually deep to alternative interpretative possibilities from within their own tradition. And by uninformed from without, I mean they are usually articulate with little to no experience of genuine encounter with the other. Or if there is experience of the other, it is short life and maybe highly negative. Now how, we ap how is the, the application of this, this point of conversation? The point of conversation between the master that immediately come to mind when we face with the problem of the Quranic and Biblical verses like what I mentioned above, is the infinite potential for meaning inherent in the nature of divine revelation. Within the context of Ibn Arabi, Master Eckhart metric for dialogue, this important hermeneutical principle would by no means require an a priori dismissal of the more exclusivist interpretation of these verses. Rather, what this principle would do is remind the participant in dialogue who are aware of these verses and the exclusivist interpretation that other possibilities for interpretation exist, which, which may well be equally defensible within the context of the larger tradition and thus depending on our authoritative consensus of the community of believers may be equally or even more orthodox in nature. Two complementary activities need to be done. The first of these activities would be to imitate the masters themselves by delving as deeply as possible into all the contextual resources available for interpreting this text. 
The second of these activities would also involve a certain imitation of the masters when it comes to the common valorization of experience and it important in interpreting sacred scripture. In this case, the experience that would be most significant would be that the encounter with the religious other, the metric, and it note of the infinite potential for meaning of scripture would encourage interpretation of all scripture, especially passages with purport to speak about religious other, to be rooted in actual experience of that other. Simple reason dictates that any interpretation of what the Quran, for example, says about Jewish or about Christian is de facto faulty if it cannot stand in the face of a given Muslim authentic relationship with Jewish or with, a Christ with Christian. Other example, interpreting doctrinal formulation. A primary illustration of this in Christian Muslim dialogue is the Christian doctrine of Trinity, for example, and or the doctrine of incarnation, and the Muslim doctrine of Tawheed. Through the note of metric that has to do with naming God I mentioned before, we hear our master asking us never to lose sight of our creatorial limitation, especially the inherent inadequacy of our mode of discourse to convey an understanding of God. Another way of putting this is to say that we do not preserve the integrity and secretness of our doctrinal formulation by absolutizing them in such a way as to exclude all the others. Rather, we preserve, this, we preserve this integrity and secretness precisely by humbly recognizing that the deepest understanding of this inherent limited linguistic formulation must leave room for validating and dignifying the religious experiences and formulation of others, no matter how different they may be from our own. Through the note of metric that has to do with the distinction between God created by the believers on one hand and the Godhead on the other, the two masters remind us that however passionately we may believe in, in the article of our faith or however passionately and devoutly we may perform our ritual, the moment we begin to use this belief and practices as weapon to establish the dominant of the self over, the, over others is the moment we mark ourselves as servant of our own egos rather than of God. By interpreting scripture with the hermeneutic of the infinite potential meaning, by never forgetting the oneness and ubiquitness of the divine being, by recognizing the limitation of our theological language and our success distinguishing between the God we create and the ultimate ineffable Godhead, we truly plumb the depth of our relationship to God by opening ourselves to go at the heart of both Islam and Christianity. That is to transform the believers into better and better being, more deeply committed to the service of God and one another. I will end my word by quoting Harold Casimo and Bilon Servin. The religion of the world are no more self-sufficient, no more independent, no more isolated than individual or nation. Horizons are wider, danger are greater, no religion is an island. We are all involved with one another. So spiritual betrayal of the part of one of one of us affect the faith <coughs> of all us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Uh, can I lead off with a question? Sure. While people formulate their own. Yeah. Um, where do you see in today's world um, the pursuit of this kind of approach in in practice, in other words, you know, um, are you aware of um, of Christians and Muslims who proceed on this kind of spiritual path or interpretation uh, in a kind of dialogic way? Yeah, I think this is more maybe in the level of academic, uh, so a dialogue in academic level. But it, it is actually it's not not such easy to to apply because as I I just had an experience um, what is that uh, two weeks ago when I was in Houston, um, uh, there was a Christian asking me how come you uh, you like uh, how come you you said that uh, what is that uh, when when I talk about um, naming God he said no for for us Jesus is God so other than Jesus is not God. So you can say that this is your perspective or you cannot say that this is your belief 
and I can believe another one. So I think one thing that we, we also, uh, and also within Muslim themselves, not only this one, for example, uh, there, there, was an, there was a rumor in Malaysia, for example, there was a, a riot because of uh, that non-Muslim using the word Allah. So they, they, they saw themselves like, oh, Allah is mine, Allah is my language, Allah is my Arabic language, so you cannot use this word. They never know that uh, where Allah come from, where the word Allah come from, right? So I think uh, uh, we still need to, uh, what is that, to introduce this or to educate them also and to, what is that, to, to let them go deeper into their own tradition. Uh, uh, especially, uh, yeah, uh, 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 right now, I think if we follow, uh, what is it, uh, um, Baron von Hugel, for, ex for example, he said that uh, every religion uh, contain uh, three elements, um, uh, institutional, um, uh, intellectual, and mystical. And uh, these three of, of elements should be uh, in harmonious relationship. But when, when one only like choose two uh, in the expense of the other, there will be a problem. And I think right now people just focus on maybe two or maybe only one of them. And they, they don't care about mystical element inside. Uh, um, maybe I can give an example in my country, for example, in Indonesia. Uh, they just like uh, what is that? Uh, focus more on celebration, uh, celebration. So that's more on institutional element. They don't care about maybe intellectual element, let alone a mystical element. I think this is why we also have to, what is it? To introduce to them that these elements should be also in your consideration, especially if we also would like to have a basis on uh, Islamic tradition. We can see from um, Hadith Jibril, for example. When Jibril come to uh, the Prophet <coughs> Muhammad and ask him uh, um, uh, what is Islam, or what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. So mystical actually is more Ihsan actually. And when we, uh, what is it, deny this or when we like uh, don't care about this, I think there is a problem and it is. I, I mean we have problem right now. Uh, uh, what is that? People actually uh, uh, just uh, what is that? Focus on uh, uh, literal meaning or focus on performance only. They never go deeper into what actually it's mean by that. It's very interesting. Uh, just to add one point, and then, then I'll go to the audience. That if you look in recent years, um, the attraction of Islam, and particularly, let's say, years ago, uh, when I first began to study Islam, 30 or 40 years ago, when most Americans didn't even know anything about Islam, when there was an attraction to other world religions, like Hinduism and Buddhism, with Islam, the attraction was to Sufism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and students could relate to Sufism. They, they were not dealing with the, the, as it were, the other elements, etc. Even with Hinduism, we used to block that out, but with Hinduism, people would be looking at the Upanishads yeah. and would not really be dealing with the fact that for the vast majority of Hindus, they function in a, uh, in a world of, um, of ritual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, and when you then look at what's been happening in recent years, you do see that um, uh, Muslims and Christians at times do come together uh, for different reasons uh, following certain Sufi masters. Yeah. You know. Um, and when you look at certain forms of Christianity, um, there are a variety now of, uh, uh, of forms that are not just outside the tradition, but within the tradition. For example, within Catholicism. Um, if, if you read um, uh, the writings of Richard Rohr and others, you see uh, an emphasis that on the one hand does not deny the institutional and doctrinal part, mm -hmm. but basically says that these, at the end of the day, that these are human constructs, and that's why often, uh, along with the good, we get a lot of bad, mm -hmm. but that one needs to go deeper, and then they start to get into really the, the mystical side of the tradition, which mm -hmm. then opens up also to, a, um, uh, you know, to the potential for um, a greater pluralism because it's to the Godhead mm -hmm. that is beyond name or yeah. names. Yeah. Um, but, but in general, 
both the average person in the way they've been brought up and in the way in which they've often been uh, brought up to practice their, their faith, as well as the majority of religious leaders who are part of the institution and uh, themselves uh, propagate um, the notion of doctrine and law, uh, often uh, mysticism then is still seen as something on the side, yeah. usually <laughs> suspect by the official yeah. people. You know, if yeah. there's a problem in Islam or potentially in Christianity, it's, oh, well, it's mysticism yeah. because it's not controlled by doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's not controlled by, you know, the average yeah. person. Yeah. And so if I look at, for example, the people that you're talking about, Ibn al-Arabi has both been celebrated mm -hmm. by the more philosophical and Sufi-oriented, uh -huh, but seen but, as a problem. Yeah. And if you were to ask your average Catholic who Meister Eckhart is, first of all, they wouldn't know who he is, yeah. and B, they would think it was probably a Protestant. <laughs> and not that it was a, probably a Dominican yeah. priest. I mean, yeah. you know, Meister Eckhart was just never seen. Yeah. They, yeah. You know, they're aware of, for example, John of the Cross or Teresa of Avila, yeah. but not quite Eckhart because he really functioned so much more at the level of, of Godhead. Yeah, even he was condemned by the Pope at that time, and I think the same also... Often a good sign, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and the same actually also about Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi, he also was condemned as heretic. Even though maybe people, uh, when you ask people um, uh, about Ibn Arabi, they never know, oh, he is a heretic, blah, blah, blah. But they don't re realize that actually they experience what Ibn Arabi was uh, uh, what is it saying actually? Mm. So they never realized that. Mm. Uh, this is why I, uh, what I, what is it, con uh, in my conclusion here, <coughs> I said it is, um, what is it, um, re what, um, rediscovering tradition. Mm. Because we need to discover, this is our own tradition, this is very rich tradition for us that we need to discover, we need to learn more about that. <coughs> And um, uh, you mentioned about the, the people. Maybe they never know about Islam, and the, uh, and then they 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 were they are very interested in Sufism. Uh, but the problem also, and also uh, that I mentioned about uh, interpretation or uh, what is it, the translation of uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, they used to see that mysticism is not part of Islamic tradition. This is why they miss some part of, of in, in the translation, the very, uh, the, what is that, the very well known tradition that, uh, uh, what is that, um, that just mentioned. Um, they miss the part that really, uh, what is that, uh, talk about who actually uh, 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 Rumi is. So they, they, they don't want to recognize that Rumi is a Muslim. They want to exclude mm. Rumi from being a Muslim, mm. even though it is not possible. Rumi, uh, he came uh, with that doctrine, actually, because mm. of his interpretation of, of the Quran. The same also about Ibn Arabi. Yeah. They condemn Ibn Arabi, but Ibn Arabi, most of his teaching it's really rooted in the Quranic, uh, what is it, uh, uh, verses, mm. but he interpret in a different way. This is what people uh, never know. Mm. I think this is mm. why, again, um, uh, it is important for us to reintroduce them to, to, to our uh, religious community. Yeah, they would emphasize what you said earlier, and therefore, whether you're talking about scripture or tradition, they would say, they would not say, read scripture again or read tradition again they would say reread scripture re -read, yeah. and reread tradition and yeah. if you're not rereading uh -huh. if you're only reading yeah. then you're approaching it with the belief that the initial interpretation that you had yeah. is the only one that's that's uh, possible uh, would anybody like to join in yes thank you for the wonderful presentation my name is Sabit Khan and uh, I'm originally from India and my question pertains to both my heritage and your heritage, India and Indonesia. Uh, from the little that I understand, I'm Muslim by the way, so that from the little that I understand my religion, uh, it has absorbed elements of other religions in India particularly, and also Indonesia. Uh, there's been a certain <coughs> syncretic development of ideas and interpretation of the text, practice as we see, and I've spent a significant portion of my life in my country, 26 years, then I lived uh, in the Middle East for about two years, and then I've been here for about two years. So, and I'm a student of Islam. I study Middle Eastern politics, Islam, and uh, I'm very curious about my own religion. Uh, what I've understood is this sort of merger of ideas has happened in certain countries, 
Indonesia, India strike out as exceptionally, you know, brilliant examples. Why hasn't that happened in other countries and other cultures? Is it historic? Is it cultural? What well, are those factors? If you were to highlight, say, maybe three factors or four factors. Uh, do, do you mean uh, uh, syncretic uh, tourism? Yes, I mean uh, bordering on mysticism and these ideas. I mean, they really flourished in these societies. So, what are those factors, or why did it happen, and why hasn't it happened in, say, I know it's too early to speak of Europe, but hey, why not? You know, we're talking of this clash, and we're seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis now. So, is it possible at all that in Western societies this might happen? Uh, as a scholar, what is your take on this? Yeah, f uh, for me myself, actually, a religion, uh, what is it, is embedded in culture. So, um, I think there is no such pure religion, right? Uh, even in the beginning, when Prophet Muhammad came to Mecca, he actually also did not disregard tradition. <coughs> So uh, I think that's why uh, for, for us we need not to just like what is it uh, take verses and out of context just apply in the sa uh, what is it uh, the same thing as it was. So this is why uh, historical context is important. So for example, like cutting hand, do we still have to apply this uh, what is it literally? But we have also to see what actually, uh, what is that, makosi du sharia. We, we have that makosi du sharia, you know that, right? So what is the purpose of that sharia? We have to know that. So uh, 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 we actually we have an example, a, a lot of example from, for example, like um, um, Umar. He didn't apply, um, uh, what is that, um, uh, after, after, after the war. Um, what we call um, it is uh, not this year. What we call it? Sharing, no. you, sharing this uh, wealth of the. Yeah, uh, I mean uh, it should be uh, in the in the era of the prophet. It should be uh, what is that uh, given to the people who involved in the war. But Omar didn't do this. He didn't do this. But this doesn't mean that he didn't apply Quranic teaching, because he see. He he see the condition. He see the contact. If I apply this, there will be many dangers uh, 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 facing a Muslim community. So I think this is why, for Muslims themselves, they have to realize that okay, we are. Of course, Islam. This is why what I I mentioned in 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 another place that Islam is not monolithic religion. Also, Christian actually also is not a monolithic religion. Islam <coughs> is a poly interpretable religion. And unlike Catholicism, for example, we don't have uh, such a church in, in Islamic tradition. This is why I mentioned, for example, Ibn Arabi, uh, uh, what is that each word of the Quran have an infinite meaning. So no one interpretation can be absolutized. We can interpret according to, uh, and that depends also on our understanding, on our contact, on the, the development of, of maybe of knowledge of, of, of society right now, for example, like that. So I think this is what we need uh, for that. And um, uh, uh, related to your question, I think that's also, uh, what is it, the problem of where uh, Islam coming uh, uh, come to that uh, the the place. I mean, in Indonesia, according to history, Islam came to Indonesia. It was brought by Sufis, actually, right? And that uh, uh, yeah, even though there is uh, what is it, a story, for example, like uh, from Hikayat uh, Raja Raja Pase, we can see that there was a certain group from Mecca uh, uh, come to Indonesia, but before coming to Indonesia, they stopped by in um, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, West, uh, West uh, Coromandel, and, and, and they brought uh, someone called Fakir Muhammad. Fakir Muhammad, they interpreted Fakir mean uh, poor. That's actually symbolized as a mystic, as a Sufi. So Fakir Muhammad and the group came to Indonesia, but the group came back and Fakir Muhammad stay in Indonesia. So he is actually the one who spread out Islam in, in our country, in, in Indonesia. So this is the, what is that usually people, uh, uh, the book that people refer to where or who uh, brought Islam to Indonesia.
So that's uh, maybe uh, quite different, uh, and I, I think that's uh, similar also to to India, uh, 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 where Islam, uh, what is it, came from, right? One of the things that undermines the the acceptance of uh, mysticism, both in Islam and Christianity, is the fact that at the heart of mysticism uh, is um, a potential challenge to institutional religion. Because what m most religions try to do, for example, hin uh, in Hinduism, the Brahmins, they develop a class of people who see themselves as the interpreters and protectors of orthodox religion. And, and protecting against all kinds of uh, external influences which will undermine, as it were, the faith. Well, but, but then that's a challenge because in mysticism, authority comes not from knowing text. It comes from experiencing the truth of text. So a priest can, can simply be somebody uh, who is an expert on text or ritual, but not necessarily is it part of the job definition to have experienced the truth. But once you get into the experiential side, of course, then people say, well, how do you know that what you're experiencing uh, isn't from the devil or isn't? And so there's always yeah. been that. And then also historically within Islam in recent centuries, there's been a tendency to say, look, what happened with mysticism, it's great that it was inclusive, but it brought in a lot of popular beliefs and a lot of superstitions. And so, you know, you see both uh, your conservative religious leaders, but also your so-called Islamic modernists, who are kind of trying to develop a, a kind of rationalist approach, both of them seeing Sufism as the cause for uh, Muslim weakness or Muslim downfall. Uh, and so that, it, and you find comparable attitudes in other faiths. Anyone else care to jump in? Yes, in the back. Thank you very much, and a wonderful dialogue. Thank both of you. Uh, some people have said that mysticism is akin to madness, but a creative form of madness. And it has to be balanced, <clears throat> very much like a creative artist would take the best out of something and weave that into a better form. Rumi was always talking about shattering forms and breaking forms, and being in the presence of, if, if it's a true teacher, spiritual teacher, something of what you believe is going to be shattered. That's the gamble of that. Um, the question is, it's like we bear those shatterings. I think of the story of Rumi where Sham says, you know, I want to meet one of your precious items, Lord. Show me one of your treasures. And God says, what will you give? And Sham says, my head. And then there's a parallel when he meets Rumi. Uh, Rumi's sitting there with a book of his writings, 20 years to write, with all of his disciples, his students. Shams waltzes in, sort of like a street person, takes the book and throws it in the well. Uh, the students get up to kill them. How dare you offend the master, this wonderful teaching tradition, this master of Islamic law. But Rumi looks into Shams' eyes and Shams says, if you'd like, I'll bring it out and every page will be dry. <clears throat> Rumi says, no, you can keep everything I knew. And Shams says, good, because it wouldn't do you any good where we're going anyway. And so it's always a process of cutting off your head. Now, I wanted you to comment, perhaps both of you, on the relationship of sacrificing self, of sacrificing one's belief in a true mystical process. Now, I realize there has to be a reintegration into society from that journey. But just the process of sacrifice, Christian and Muslim, since I both think you could mm. both handle that amply. Mm. Well, I mean, I would just say that if, if, if you look at most of the classical forms of mysticism uh, or spirituality, so that I can bring in you know, Zen Buddhism, a good deal of it really has to do with seeing that uh, your beliefs and your rituals are true insofar as they are pointers and have symbolic significance. But to the extent that uh, you cling to them and think that they themselves are, are the absolute, uh, they need to be shattered. Uh, and so, for example, in Buddhism, there's the notion of if you see a Buddha, kill him. Uh, uh, so so that, that part of the notion. Y you also see it reflected in the classical tradition, but also in, in some recent spiritual uh, writing occurring across traditions, where people are talking now about the false self versus the true self. And how a good deal of the false self, while false, false is, is good and necessary. So, for example, we develop an, our, our ID. 
as we grow up, you know, we, we are uh, students, we are family members, and, and we need to uh, support ourselves, etc. all of which is really fine. But to the extent that that is not seen as, as, as a, a totally human construct, but rather is seen as the end in itself, then it blocks your ability to see the deeper dimension of reality that exists, whether one calls that Buddha nature, calls it the Godhead, etc. And so even naming God is important because we need to name things. Uh, but to the extent that you then see the name as not simply a, a symbol, then you wind up with somebody who says, the Christian who says, well, Allah is a foreign God because he's looking at the Arabic term, you know, even though Christians and Muslims in uh, Muslim societies use that term. Or folks in Malaysia, the ultra-conservative types, suddenly saying after a, a century in which uh, Catholics have been using that term, for example, well, no, it's like, no, that's the proper name of God and as if it captures the essence of God. Yeah. Um, um there is a saying from uh, uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, you may know that, I think. Uh, when you pull the ocean into a jug, how much it can hold? So uh, we know that God is incomprehensible, right? But we, we keep trying to comprehend God. But our comprehension of God, of course, is very limited. This is why Rumi said, how much this jug can hold? Uh, what is it, the, the ocean? And in, in the language of uh, 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 Ibn Arabi, actually, he was saying that uh, the color of the water if of, is of its container. So the water is colorless, right? But then we put in a, in a, in a container that's become colorful. That actually, uh, what is it, the imagination of how we uh, want to understand God. But one thing also that uh, what is that um, uh, um, our master warned us is, for example, like even uh, uh, Master Eckhart, he said, "Let's pray to God in order to get rid of God." So that actually, this is why he differentiated between God created by the believers. But nothing wrong. Uh, this is what Ibn Arabi was saying. Nothing wrong with God created by yourself, as far as you realize that God created by yourself is not uh, the real God. So you have to go beyond that to go to the Godhead, to go to the real God, the essence. Right? And, and um, another saying from, from uh, uh, Master Rekhan, I like him a lot. This is why I, I, what is it? I, what is, I really um, would like to go deeper into him. He also says, if you look for the way, you got the way, but you miss God. This is actually the critique from a mystic, uh, uh, what is a tradition. Usually for traditionalist Muslim, they just focus on observation of like praying and praying and praying, right? So they, they, they are dealing like, uh, did you do uh, what, did you do well when you take a wudu, for example, or did you do well when you take this one, this one? So. You only get that way, but you never come to God. So you miss God, actually. This is what Mr. Eckhart, uh, what is that, remind us, uh, warn us. I think that that, that mm. is... Yeah. Some modern mystics, uh, or, sorry, so, some modern spiritual leaders talk about the fact that the container is fine, but the problem is most people don't realize that all they have is the container, that they don't see beyond the container, you know, which is the doctrine, etc. Uh, I should point out to you that Meister Eckhart, Meister means master, so it's not as if we know his, his first name. So I'm kind of hoping that someday I'll be called Meister Esposito. But, uh, <laughs> but we had somebody else in the back, if I remember, and then I'll come up forward. Yeah. Shay Al-Akbar. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, th I'm reminded of this, um, this joke where these theologians are in heaven and they're arguing, is God, is Jesus black or white? And they're insistent, no, Jesus is black, no, no, Jesus is white. And they're just furiously insistent. They're almost violently insistent. And then Jesus walks by and says, hey, buenos dias, compañeros. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
But so my, my, my question is really, from an academic's perspective, you really, you know, phrase this really beautifully when you say that, you know, when you sort of trap yourself in your own egoism, you miss the mark. So from a practical perspective, because it's a piece in dialogue that tries to translate into policy forum, how would you move people into a place of humility where they acknowledge and realize that, um, that, that the egoism is really is, is fueling people's violence in, in, in not just a physical way, but in an emotional and intellectual way. That, that intellectual violence <coughs> happens when people are insistent on their own you know, definitions of containers. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think humility is, is uh, what is uh, the important um, uh, word for, for this one. Um, usually for lay people, uh, because it is not easy, right? This is more philosophical. What we discuss actually is more philosophical. For usually for, for lay people, I used to say for them, um, um, uh, for example, I, I used to say, uh, I give an example of what happening in my country. For example, um, our president, um, uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, he says something, for example. But uh, uh, people interpret different way what he was saying. So he said, for example, uh, my salary never increased since 2007. People have a different interpretation for that. Some people said, oh, SBA, oh, my president, our president need to increase his salary. Oh, uh, but the other one, no, he's not saying that. He's saying that, look, even though my salary is not increasing, but I did a very good job. So that's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what is that? Even it is not scripture. Even it is just our our what is it our word that have a lot of interpretation. This is what it's mean by uh, uh, what is that an uh, infinite um, meaning of the word. I think so that may be easier for them to to what is it to understand. Oh yeah, so uh, uh, even um, uh, what is that what I'm talking uh, with you? Maybe people will misunderstood. Uh, what I was saying, for example. So I think that's uh, that's easier for for people, but. Um, uh, actually, for, for, for the grassroots, for lay people, and, and you are talking about uh, violent, uh, uh, what is that, um, maybe religious violent, uh, that's actually more complicated because uh, uh, so far I think I still believe that religion is not a problem. There are many problems, maybe about uh, economic, uh, politic, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, about land, about jealousy, something like that. So uh, violent, uh, uh, I went to uh, many different places the, where the hotspot of conflict and I found uh, actually religion is, religion never uh, uh, <coughs> become the root of conflict. But uh, uh, people use or maybe we can say abuse religion for their vested interests. I think that's what, what I found from uh, 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 many uh, places. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our program. So uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to our esteemed author. And I encourage you all to buy her book, because it actually is really readable. It's a great read. Thank you.